This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez, as we turn to look at civil rights leader John Lewis's early years of activism and his pivotal role in the Freedom Rides of 1961. John Lewis had been heavily involved with lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville, Tennessee, when, at the age of 21, he applied and was chosen to be among the 13 original Freedom Riders who rode buses across the South to challenge segregation laws. In this clip from the PBS documentary Freedom Riders, directed by Stanley Nelson, Congressmember John Lewis reads from his application to participate in the first Freedom Ride. I wish to apply for acceptance as a participant in CORE's Freedom Ride, 1961. I'm a senior at American Baptist Theological Seminary and hope to graduate in June. I know that an education is important, and I hope to get one. But at this time, human dignity is the most important thing in my life, that justice and freedom might come to the deep south. John Lewis was on the first Freedom Ride when it departed Washington, D.C. on May 4, 1961, with seven black and six white passengers. Lewis was also among the first of the activists to face physical violence when he and two other Freedom Riders were severely beaten by white supremacists in Rock Hill, South Carolina. For more on the significance of these rides and John Lewis's legacy as a young civil rights leader, we go to Tuskegee, Alabama, where we're joined by his lifelong friend, co-conspirator, former roommate Bernard Lafayette, a civil rights leader and scholar who participated in the Nashville, New Orleans Freedom Ride in 1961, a leader in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which John Lewis headed. Bernard Lafayette, now a professor at Auburn University in Alabama, welcome to Democracy Now! Now, it's great to have you with us. Um, Bernard Lafayette, uh, we last spoke to you when Freedom Riders, the documentary by Stanley Nelson, came out at the Sundance Film Festival a few years ago. But take us back, how you first met John Lewis, and take us back to the sit-ins and then the Freedom Rides. Thank you very much. And I want to, first of all, say that I really appreciate what you're doing in terms of documenting history, because our young people can take advantage of understanding the particulars and how things changed so that they can help to maintain those changes and they make even more. So what you are doing is extremely important, and I'm happy to be here to join you. When I was a student at American Baptist College, uh, John Lewis and I were roommates, and we decided that um, we were going to uh, participate in the workshops uh, that Jim Lawson was conducting there in Nashville, focused on the sit-ins. And uh, it was John who persuaded me to go to the workshops, because I had so many jobs on campus, I did not have time for another workshop. But as John has always been, he's very persuasive and he's persistent. So I went to the workshops just to stop hearing John talk. And I, lo and behold, I was uh, completely consumed by the uh, information and the strategy and that sort of thing. So it was John that really recruited me into it. Now, one thing I want to say is that after the uh, sit-ins in 1960, and by the way, we actually desegregated the lunch counters in Nashville in about three months. We were one of the first student groups in our community, in different communities that uh, did that. One of the things that did that was the fact that we had strategy. We had Diane Nash as our spokesperson because she had to deal with uh, the media and be able to uh, uh, put it in such a way that it was appealing, because we had to try to win as many people over as possible to make changes. You cannot uh, do it without winning the sympathy, if not the active support, of the majority. So we got the majority of uh, people in uh, Nashville to really support what we were doing. We had an economic boycott that was by 90 percent effective. And uh, that was one of the things that showed us we had support from uh, many different people. So the and Bernard, Bernard Lafayette, uh, when you uh, 
for the younger people who are watching or listening to this show, could you talk about what exactly were the Freedom Rides? What did you do on a day-to-day -day basis? And talk and if you could talk about the work that you and John Lewis did to desegregate the Greyhound buses. <laughs> yes. Well, after the sit-ins took place and we were able to uh, desegregate the lunch counters, one of the places that we uh, had uh, the uh, you know, integration was the bus station itself, because we had lunch counters at the bus station, and so therefore uh, we uh, also sat in at the uh, those lunch counters. So, the Greyhound bus station was completely desegregated before the Freedom Ride started. At Christmas of 1960, John Lewis and I decided we were going to take the Greyhound bus, but we were going to sit on the front seat. The Greyhound bus was still segregated, even though the station was integrated in Nashville. So I sat behind the driver, and John sat behind the uh, uh, the, the next seat in the front of the bus. Well, we rode all the way from Nashville. We got off at Troy, uh, John did, and I continued. And uh, we desegregated that bus. So when the freedom rides were announced uh, by core Congress of Racial Equality, there was no question that we were going to go on the freedom rides. And uh, so happened that John was 21 in February of that year, of 1960, and I uh, was not going to be 21 until the uh, July. So when we applied, John Lewis got accepted, but I didn't get accepted because I needed parental permission and my parents wouldn't give permission. My father say, I'm not going to sign your death warrant. So that was already before the freedom ride started that there was some question about whether or not we would survive. Well, John went on the original ride and as mentioned, he was beaten up there in, uh, uh, in the first uh, leg of the first uh, part of the Freedom Rides. But we decided we were going to continue. And the reason why the Freedom Rides continued is because John Lewis came back to Nashville and said, let's go. So we got permission to take over the Freedom Rides. So I didn't need parental permission. So he and I got together and he took the first group and I was had the backup group because you have to have a backup group in case if the first group got arrested, the only way you can continue is to have some more people ready to go. And so we had strategy and we had experience and um, we had leadership ability and we continued that freedom ride from Birmingham on into Montgomery. In Montgomery, we were met with uh, violence. And this was after we had traveled from Birmingham to Montgomery with armed guards the federal, you know, national guards and all those people were surrounding us because they had promised to give protection, the governor. But once we got to the bus station, all of the protection uh, disappeared and we were on the platform. And uh, Jim's work uh, was beaten up and John Lewis was clobbered and I got kicked in the uh, chest and had three broken ribs. So there was nothing you could do with broken ribs. So I went through the entire Freedom Rides with uh, three broken ribs. I didn't tell my fellow Freedom Riders because they might have insisted that I not go. So I just kept quiet. I quietly suffered the entire trip. Uh, Can so you describe what happened, um, in Bernard Lafayette, in Rock Hill, South Carolina? Um, Congressman Clyburn talks now about regretting um, that he didn't meet uh, the Freedom Ride bus when it came in, but his wife was pregnant and she wanted him with him. Uh, with she wanted him with her. Uh, but the significance and the violence that you were met with was John Lewis in Rock Hill. Yes, he was beaten up. Um... And uh, that's one of the, uh, the uh, further first uh, retaliation of the uh, people uh, who were against the uh, freedom rides. So uh, they survived that, and they went on, 
and the bus and it got burned in Anniston, Alabama, and the others uh, went into uh, Birmingham and they were beaten and that sort of thing on the buses. So for the early part of uh, the Freedom Rides, the violence had already manifested itself. And, and uh, I'm wondering if you could talk also about the um, John Lewis's leadership role. He became chairman of SNCC uh, and, and was later succeeded in 1966 by Stokely Carmichael. Uh, and of course, there was a major shift in, the, uh, in SNCC at the time, Carmichael becoming more frustrated and, and disillusioned with the, the, white, the white liberal establishment of the Democratic Party after the 64 convention goes in the direction of uh, black, black power movement and, into, and eventually into the Black Panthers. The importance of John Lewis is maintaining his views on Nonviolence and why this was such a core of your activism. How, how did the Lewis deal with the changing debates uh, at that time over uh, nonviolence and uh, and black power? Well, first um, thing that is important to understand is that it was the student nonviolent coordinating committee. It was made up of student leaders from various colleges and universities, and they were pulled together by uh, Ella Baker, who worked for Martin Luther King, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And these uh, students uh, were there uh, <clears throat> in Raleigh because at Shaw University, because Ella Baker was a graduate of Shaw University. She was an older woman at this time, but nevertheless, this was a school that was very receptive to this national conference, and we formed that. And Marion Barry, who was one of our students from Nashville, was the first chairman of SNCC. He was a graduate student, uh, who had working on his master's program, and uh, he showed a good deal of leadership in Nashville as well. John Lewis showed leadership because he was a uh, president of his class, and then he was the president of student body at American Baptist Theological Seminary. So he had that leadership ability all the time. But he didn't promote himself. Others promoted him. It was a student organization, so John was no longer a student. Neither was, um, you know, Stokely Carmichael, but Car Stokely wanted to uh, be the chairman because he wanted to be take the leadership of uh, of SNCC, but SNCC was supposed to be for students, and that's the thing that uh, that happened that took it into a different direction because the students no longer were students uh, in those leadership positions. So um, the whole idea of uh, black power. Now, let me, I don't know, we don't have time to do this, but let me give you a hint of what was happening. Stokely and I were cellmates on the Freedom Ride in Jackson, Mississippi, so we stayed up all night arguing with each other about nonviolence. Now, Stokely also felt that black people should continue to take the leadership of the voter registration movement and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, blacks who had been subjugated to segregation and oppression for so many years had, uh, had, had carved out for, uh, out of themselves and their experience to be submissive to white folk. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking it down for you now, okay? When black students who were part of SNCC went into Mississippi and some places in Alabama and tried to recruit black people to go down and register, they say, get out of here with that mess. When white students went and told them they were going to come pick them up and they were going to take them to register to vote, they say, what time should I be ready? <laughs> Bernard Lafayette, we just That's have a minute. <laughs> 
And I wanted to come back to today. His last public appearance, John Lewis, uh, was at Black Lives Matter Plaza, the, with the big words, Black Lives Matter, outside the White House, outside Lafayette Park. Um, you were youth leaders then. You were very active in Selma with John Lewis. If What message do you and do you feel John Lewis had, especially for young people organizing today? Well, that was one of the genius of John Lewis, is that he knew how to relate to people who were different from him and who had different orientations, different values, different philosophies. And that's why he was such a great leader, because he didn't put people down or ignore them or say a lot of negative things about them simply because they didn't agree with him. He found a way to make a way. And he was always looking at the synthesizing our approach Bernard rather than dividing. I, we are going to have to leave it there. But before we go, I want to wish you a very happy 80th birthday. Thank you. Bernard Lafayette, civil rights leader, scholar, longtime friend of the late Congress member John Lewis, his former roommate. We wish you a very happy birthday. And that does it for our broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe, save lives, wear a mask.